Welcome to the Heartbreak to Happiness Show with Sarah Davison. If you're struggling with a breakup and you feel shocked, angry, betrayed, devastated, or sad and alone, then this podcast is for you. Best selling author and award winning host Sarah Davison shares how you too can get on with your life to heal, grow, and move from heartbreak to happiness. Here's your host, Sarah Davison. Welcome back to the show and today my guest is Robert Mack. Robert is an Ivy League educated positive psychology expert, TV producer and personality and published author. In addition to serving as celebrity love coach for Famously Single on the E! Network for two seasons, Robert also served as a consulting producer and on-camera expert for Mind Your Business on OWN, an executive producer and host of Good Morning La La Land on Apple TV and Hulu for three seasons. Robert's work has been endorsed by Oprah, Vanessa Williams and many others and he's been featured on Good Morning America, The Today Show, CBS Morning Show and Access Hollywood and seen in the pages of GQ, Self, Health, Cosmopolitan and Glamour magazines. Robert's first book, Happiness from the Inside Out, The Art and Science of Fulfillment, is celebrity endorsed and critically acclaimed. And his most recent release, Love from the Inside Out, Lessons and Inspiration for Loving Yourself, Your Life and Each Other, is a bestseller. So I am super, super excited to welcome the one and only Robert Mack, to the show. Welcome, Robert. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I am a super fan and I love your work. So I I also know this is gonna resonate with so many of my listeners and I could talk to you for hours. So I'm gonna do my best (laughs) to ask you some great questions to get as much from you as possible. So thank you so much for being here. Why don't we start with your story? Because personally, I find it so inspiring and I think a lot of my listeners are gonna resonate with this. Yeah, so um, I often joke that I'm the least likely person in the world to be a happiness coach on one hand and a love coach on the other, because my first memories in life were of being self-hating and self-loathing and extraordinarily depressed. And I always thought I would grow out of it. You know, at six or seven years of age, I wasn't really aware of what depression was or self-hate or self-judgment was. But looking back, that's all I experienced. And I had a really loving family, a great life for the most part. Um, lots of stress in our family, like most families. But, um, you know, I just was very um, sad. And as I got older, I thought, well, I'll grow out of it. You know, I'll do well athletically and academically, socially, hopefully, relationally, maybe financially. And a lot of those things did happen. You know, I did pretty well in school. I was saluted toward in my high school class. I eventually made a friend or two. <laughs> um, I had a girlfriend eventually, she was great. I uh, did well athletically, baseball and football and cross country. Um, and despite all that, my depression got worse. And I got to a place where I was contemplating suicide daily, dozens of times a day. Yeah. Well, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, how old are you at that point? Because with all that going on, most people will look at you, I guess, and think, well, he's got everything to be happy about. Yeah, I think I started probably experiencing the suicidal ideation at 12 or 13 probably. And then, uh, you know, it seemed to get worse as time went on. I uh, came to a crescendo in my early 20s. I was working a consulting jar- job, which I hated. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people were great, but I hated the job. And I felt really out of alignment with life and the world and other people and myself. So I did some research, decided I was gonna kill myself. Um, I didn't have access to lots of the means and methods um, and the other means and methods felt very violent. So mm-hmm. I decided I was gonna slash my wrist. So I got a kitchen knife and steak knife and I dug it into my wrist. And I had the most unexpected, unpredictable, inexplicable experience at that time. Like without anything changing, I remember I had a pretty good life. I making good money at the consulting firm and this incredible girlfriend, I was healthy, my family loved me. Despite all of that, I was depressed and suicidal dug this knife in without anything changing externally, I felt a peace 
and a kind of love and joy just wash over me. And it was the kind of peace, love and joy that just felt unshakable and immovable and unreasonable, right? And so I decided I was gonna postpone the suicide for like 10 or 15 minutes. It's so laughable now, you know, but then it was a big deal. It was like 10 minutes. I'm not gonna be able to make 10 minutes. I want this to be over now. But I waited 10 minutes and in that time I started doing some research. And instead of focusing really on ways to kill myself, I started focusing on, well, what is depression? What is happiness? What is unhappiness? And I learned a ton in the process. So that was probably over, well over two decades ago. Wow. And, uh, my life has never been the same since. Gosh. I mean, that's such a moving story. And for those people listening who have been suicidal, I know a lot of people that come on my retreats have been, and I have been, uh, there was one incident in my life which completely turned my world completely upside down. And I don't think you can really understand what that's like until you've been there. Um, but I mean, listening to your story, this can happen to anyone, right? And I know the suicide rates in the UK are soaring, unfortunately, right now, it's, especially in the teenage years, which is obviously when you were affected. I mean, 12 is such a young age to start thinking about those things because, you know, two decades ago, you know, that wasn't really, that sort of information wasn't as readily available as it is now, right? So now, as I see it, suicide is now on the sort of coping mechanism smorgasbord for kids right now. How do I cope? I don't fit in, or I'm not sure about something, or I didn't get grades, or I got dumped. How do I cope better? Well, self-harming and suicide are quite firmly on that list with how-to videos on YouTube and all sorts of things that we didn't have access to as, as children. So, I mean, are you seeing this in the States as well? Absolutely, no question about it. Um, COVID certainly did not help in that respect. And um, suicide rates um, were escalating quite a bit before COVID, uh, continue to do so. Uh, depression is always um, sort of seemingly on the rise. And, you know, um, that being said, that also means, you know, to a large extent, people are suffering or becoming more sensitive and aware of their suffering at an earlier age. And therefore the opportunity for awakening and for peace and love and joy is greater and happens earlier now than it ever did before as well. Right, um, so there's great benefit in that. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about adversity, including depression and uh, suicidal ideation, is that it brings you to a, an awareness of what doesn't work, isn't working with respect to happiness or peace or love um, or joy, right? So it, though, even though it feels like, and it is a deeply uh, dissatisfying experience, it's also divine discontent. Right, so that discontent is leading away from the things, people, places, activities, sensations, perceptions, conditions, and circumstances that aren't working to provide you the happiness you want, and it's pointing you in another direction. But sometimes you need a little, need a little guidance from someone who's been there before to, to sort of get there. Um, so yeah. I do want to make sure I'm also pointing out the flip side of that. Absolutely, and and I'm a big believer that any kind of adversity can become your greatest strength, and I know that. You know, everything that I've been through and I know a lot of my listeners with their breakups and the heartbreak and the betrayal that maybe they've suffered or the abuse you know that actually you can turn that around and, and make that pain your, your superpower if you like so absolutely and, I, and I'm glad you, you you brought that up you were talking there about peace joy and love and I think for people who are in the midst of that heartbreak that pain that betrayal coming out of toxic relationships that all sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, everybody wants that, <laughs> you know, that peace. It, I mean, I know that was one of the biggest things on my list coming out of a, an abusive relationship. Just peace would be just great. But how, I guess, is what people are looking for, the how to sort of move towards it. So maybe first of all, what, what does that sort of joy or happiness and that, and that love, what does that actually mean, Robert, for you? Oh, I love your questions and, and I love your heart. I really do. I, uh, we were joking before sort of we got on air here about how I've uh, really never trusted anyone who hasn't been heartbroken or depressed or experienced suicidal ideation because you kind of have to be really insensitive to not feel what and notice what's happening in your world, um, in life and in, within yourself, right? So, so there's that. Um, I will say that to your, answer your question, you know, I think of love, peace, and happiness as synonyms. And so let's talk about happiness and love. I think we often think of happiness and love as two different energies, but it's really 
two different perceptions of the same energy. It's two different ways of looking at the same thing. So it's not two different coins, it's two sides of the same coin. So when you're really happy and you're all by yourself and you're hanging out at home, I call that happiness. When you're happy and you're out and about with people, you're extroverted, you're outgoing for that moment that day, or just in general, I call it love. So love is your happiness shared, right? And, and, and so that's one way to think about it is that- I it's love that. I love yeah. that. Love is your happiness shared. Yeah. Are you struggling to cope with your breakup or divorce? Are you feeling devastated, heartbroken, sad and anxious? If so, please know that you are not alone and there is help available. Sarah Davison, best known as the Divorce Coach, and her team of accredited coaches are here to offer you the support and guidance you need to navigate all areas of your breakup, take back your control, and start feeling happy again. Sarah will show you how to dial down those controlling negative emotions, unhook from your ex, get back in the driving seat of your life, and design a future you are excited to live. Sarah has a range of solutions to support any breakup, including free guides, one-to-one -one coaching, her Heartbreak to Happiness virtual retreats, live retreats, and you can even train to be a breakup and divorce coach with Sarah too. Visit www.saradavison.com today and start to feel happy again. So, um, and I think of happiness as just peaceful aliveness. I think often we think of happiness as this saccharine, superficial um, excitement or pleasure. It can include that, certainly includes that, um, but it's deeper than that too. It's a peaceful aliveness that's all pervasive, that's omnipresent, and that exists not only within you, but as you. And that's something we can talk more about, but the idea there is that even with your most unhappy thoughts and feelings, there is still happiness underneath, between, below, above, and beyond that unhappy, those unhappy thoughts and feelings. That happiness is the ground of your being. And you know that because sometimes you can have crazy thoughts and still feel happy, or you can have really happy thoughts and still feel, feel unhappy. But underneath all of that, I promise, is a peaceful aliveness that is always there. It's like the sun that's always shining in the sky, but is sometimes, sometimes veiled by clouds. Same thing with happiness. Happiness is always there shining inside of you, but sometimes it's clouded or veiled by thoughts and emotions. Oh, I love that. I really love that because I'm a big believer of that too. And, and when I get to the end of the interview, I'm going to ask you a question, which is going to be an odd question for you, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It's about happiness. But the, I ask all my guests the same question, you see. So, but I think it's fascinating because most people think I'm going to be happy when... I get that promotion or when I meet somebody else seeing as I'm single right now or you know when my kids leave home I'm going to be able to then feel happy because I'll be able to focus more time on me but it's rarely now so what you're saying is that you could be happy now no matter what's going on in fact now is the only time to be happy now is the only time to be happy right Ooh, you, yeah, there, there is no other time to be happy um time we know is an illusion right it's uh, mind made um, another way of saying that is that um, now is all that, all that exists, okay? The future is fantasy. No one's ever touched the future. When the future shows up, it shows up as a, another present moment. It's always the present moment. It just shows up as another present moment. So the future is fantasy. The past is history or memory. Only the, only the present is reality, right? So I'll say that again. So all, future is fantasy. The past is memory or history. Only the present moment is reality, is real. Right. So that means that you can either be happy now or never. And so while it feels like you can postpone the happiness until tomorrow, fine, or the next day, you're still going to be left with the same tools and devices for the most part that are available to you today to be happy. Right. So now is the only time to be happy to choose happiness. And that doesn't mean you need to choose it for the rest of your life. You don't. You know, in fact, I'd argue that that's not what you want to do. You don't want to say, I'm going to choose to be happy for the rest of my life, although that's what ha happens. Just choose here and now, what can I do that would allow me to feel more of that ease and playfulness and joyfulness that I call happiness? And at the very least, if I can't do a whole lot to change the external conditions and circumstances in my life this red hot minute, 
how can I either accept what's happening and where I am, take my mind off of the painful, uncomfortable, unhappy circumstance conditions, or focus on things that are more positively engaging, absorbing, and exciting or inspiring, right? So in other words, how can I, at the very least, not make the pain more painful? How can I not add insult to injury by feeding all my unhappy thoughts and feelings? Yeah, it's such, such good advice, actually, because fighting those moments, in my experience, having had quite a few of them, it makes it worse. And either you're feeding in your energy into the other you know, energy that you're trying, whether it's somebody else or a situation, you're feeding that because that's all you're focusing on it and it becomes a bigger thing, right? Yeah, energetically. You're... Spoken like the guru that you are, that is exactly right. I mean, you know, it's true. It sounds like, and it is a platitude or cliche, but platitudes, platitudes and cliches are platitudes and cliches for a reason, right? So what you resist persists. What you fight, you feed. What you fight, you invite, right? What you focus on grows. You don't want to do that, right? And most of us think and feel that by thinking about everything that's going wrong in our lives, we'll somehow make everything right. Or by focusing on all the unhappy parts of ourselves or our partners or our lack in our life, that somehow we'll find happiness. But you simply cannot get to happiness by focusing on the unhappiest parts of yourself in your life and the world. You cannot find love by focusing on the lack thereof or the lovelessness that you see in the world, yourself, um, or in other people. It just does not work that way. One of my favorite quotes, I think you'll appreciate this one, is um, the law of flotation wasn't discovered by contemplating the sinking of things. In other words, happiness will not be discovered by thinking about the unhappiness of things. Love will not be discovered by thinking about the loneliness or the lovelessness of things or of people or of places, right? So the key is to focus on happiness if you want to be happy. Focus on love if you want to be loved. You can't focus on the opposite and expect to ever discover what you truly want and need. Yeah. Oh, such powerful words. I love that. The flotation wasn't invented by focusing on sinking. And that's exactly, you know, what we're talking about here because we really want to survive and thrive. Surviving is one thing. Thriving is another. And you, you talked there a little bit about love. You mentioned it. And that's a big word. I mean, you know, love, there's many different types of love, aren't there? So when, when you're talking about love, what, what, what do you mean by love, Robert? Yeah, so love is your true nature. Um, and the same way that happiness is your true nature. Um, a great way to think about it is when you fall asleep at night, that moment right before you drift off into unconsciousness, um, which is just one way of talking about it because we're never really fully unconscious. We are conscious in itself, that aside. That moment right before you fall to sleep where you're so tired, you barely want to move your body and you're so tired, you don't have many thoughts left. So you forget everything and everyone in the world, including yourself. You forget all your fears and all your dreams and desires. And for that one moment, that micro moment, you're so at peace. You're so relaxed that it's this blissfully alive love that's, just unreasonable, it's without reason, right? It's illogical, it has no logic to support it. It's that peace that passeth understanding, it's the love that passeth understanding, it's the happiness that passeth understanding. That peace, love, and joy is, as you can see, not caused by anything at all, it's uncaused, right? It's not attached to any condition, it's unconditional, it's not dependent on any circumstance, right? It's not circumstantial. So, so all that being said, that is as um, your true nature. And that is always bubbling within you at all times, despite who you are or are not surrounded by in love with and so on, right? So love is this thoughtless, wordless, faceless, formless, infinite, eternal source or ground of being that you essentially are. So there's big words that just mean when you're not lost in discursive thought and you're not overthinking and you're not overanalyzing, you already feel the love that you essentially are. And so the challenge and opportunity in our lives is to get our stories and our thoughts out of the way so that we can feel more consistently this infinite source of love that is not only within you, but is you, right? So it's hard to put words to it because the words often just get in the way of it. Um, explanation is often um, not nearly as good as experience. So experience is better and sort of um, the only explanation, right? 
well, I think you just blew us all away with your words there. I don't, I don't know about, about that. You know, I get it. It's, it's powerful. And I, I think the interesting thing for me is that love, when you're talking about it, is you are love. Now, I know a lot of people listening will be thinking, I am looking for love. Therefore, it's external. So how, how do I find that, Robert? But you're talking about it from a very different point of view. Yes. So let's use a little science. So I know when I was struggling and going through this, I probably heard words similar to this and I didn't always connect right away. Although intuitively I could feel it, I could feel the hit. I knew intuitively it was right, but I had a hard time getting my head around it. So I leaned into science in the beginning. So I'll share a little science. So let's think about love as happiness. Let's just call it happiness. And let's forget all of these myths, misconceptions, um, and misunderstandings we have around love. Like love is uh, painful and Love is suffering. Let's just throw that out for a minute. Let's just assume that love is happy and love is joyful and love is free. Okay. So let's talk about it in terms of happiness itself. We know based on 20 decades or 20 years, two decades of research out of places like University of Pennsylvania and Stanford and Harvard, that the happiest people experience the best that life has to offer. Okay. And they're not happy because they experience the best. They experience the best because they're happy first. Right. Ah. Right. Right. So happy people live longer, six to seven years longer than their unhappy counterparts. Happy people get married earlier, stay married longer, are happier in all the relationships, whether they're married or not. It's not about marriage, it's about love. Happy people are rated as more attractive than their unhappy counterparts. And it's not the other way around. It's not that they're more attractive first and therefore happier. They get happy and then they're rated as more attractive. There's something called a Duchenne smile, which is a smile that you have, Sarah, it's so beautiful. You can't fake it. Okay, it's genuine and it moves people, it moves people without trying to move people just by smelling from this deep place inside, people feel more attracted to you and they see you as more attractive. Also, happy people make more money. They make about 600 to $700,000 more on average than their unhappy counterparts um, over the course of their lifetime. Wow. Happy people experience less job burnout. They also are kinder and more charitable and more generous. So they donate more time and energy and blood. Um, but you know, essentially they invest more in social causes, right? So happiness improves your life in all ways. Also, and here's the real kicker, happy people are easier to get along with, right? I mean, when you're happy, how easy are you to get along with? You're so easy to get along with. Also, when you're happy, other people are easier for you to get along with. The annoying, right? So this is why happiness is, happy people are, are the best lovers, right? Happy people are lovers and happy people are the most easily lovable people, right? The most loving people. Um, and happiness is attractive, literally and figuratively. And so if you're really truly wanting to experience this beautiful, blissful, um, brilliant relationship that you're after, the best thing you could possibly do is find that happiness within yourself, okay? And another way to talk about happiness is talk about self-love, right? If you can find a way to love yourself, and by love yourself, I mean love yourself even in your aloneness, you can learn to love your aloneness, you'll find that your loneliness more and more slips away. And that all that loneliness is turned into love, to self-love. When you're so full of self-love and of happiness that you can't contain it any longer and you have to just share it and share it easily and effortlessly and joyfully, not to do anyone else a service or a justice, but just you share it because you can't contain it any longer and you're just bursting with this peace, love or self-love and joy and you just release it or let it out to unburden yourself and to relieve you or to relieve yourself of this burden of the peace and self-love and joy. You give and share it without an expectation of reciprocity or reward, without quid pro quo. You do it just for joy's sake alone. And that's a highly attractive energy. So if you're really wanting to attract a lover or a partner much more quickly, easily, effortlessly, and enjoyably, you're wanting to find a way to get happy, as happy as humanly possible without a partner. And if you can do that, I promise you'll find a partner so much more quickly. I love this. This is great, great advice. Uh, I mean, getting happy and finding love, I think, are two things that my listeners are going to be thinking, yes, this is what we want. This guy's awesome. So the next question is, well, how do we do this when you might be at some of those lows we talked about earlier where the love of your life maybe has just left you, you feel heartbroken, you don't see that light at the end of the tunnel as much as you might want the happiness and the love. How do we get to that point, Robert? Yeah, so I'm um, gonna say it in two ways and I'm gonna give you four steps essentially, okay? Great. 
So, so one way to think about it is that um, the only way to be happy is to look at, think about, consume, focus on the happiest parts or aspects of everybody and everything, starting with yourself for no other reason except to feel happy. Boom. <laughs> Right, and it's like critical. Okay, it's it's so simple, and I laugh at myself sometimes. I'm like, that's not that, deep. but it actually to apply it is everything. Right, so look for any reason to feel good. Look for any reason to be happy. Think about and talk about only the happiest parts and aspects of everything and everybody, including and starting with yourself. Another way of saying the same thing. Some folks are more love oriented than happiness oriented. So I would say the same thing, replacing the word happiness with love, and say, look for things to love. And so everywhere you look, every time you talk or think to anyone, about anyone, particularly yourself, think about and talk about only those things, those parts, those aspects of everybody and everything that you love. You're starting with including yourself and do it only to feel good, right? So that's- That's, that's a really interesting point. At my retreat, I get people to, my, my delegates to write down the things that they're good at, that they love about themselves. And this is the bit they really struggle with because I think it's hard sometimes to, to be kind to yourself. Like sometimes this sort of self-care is interpreted as selfish to a lot of people who have sacrificed a lot in relationships. Oh, Sarah, I mean, I think that um, we are soul siblings here because I have, I, I've, um, you give me shivers and I have this test as a soul shiver test. Anytime I get these shivers, it lets me know I'm just uh, in line with someone about something. Um, and I felt that way the entire time we've been connected. And so I'll say this, um, you're right. Um, so Michael Jordan, great basketball player, once yeah. said, um, it takes an incredibly selfish person to be unselfish. I couldn't agree more that you have to be authentically selfish in the beginning to be authentically selfless in the end. You have to go to the source for peace, love, and happiness. And you have to do so selfishly, okay? So you have to get love from the source of peace, love, and happiness within you. And when you do that, you do that fully and truly, you're able to give from that source selflessly, perfectly unselfishly. So you give without any expectation of reciprocity or reward. And so what that means is you're right, it's both. It's both that um, you know, love can feel like, self-love can feel like a very selfish endeavor, but you can only share what you have. And so if you have unhappiness, you will only share unhappiness. If you have sickness, which is what unhappiness is, or loneliness, which is lon what loneliness is, you will only share that sickness, that loneliness, and that sadness with other people. Other people do not need more sadness. They do not need more loneliness or anxiety, right? And so if we want, if we want to truly be helpful to the world and to others, we want to remember that our self-love is our gift to the world. Our happiness is our gift to the world. And so we've got to go to the source for the happiness and peace and love that we want in order to share it fully and freely. Right? So it's like being rich. It's hard to really truly give from a place of unselfishness if you don't have a whole lot of money because you are attached to it. You're freaked out. You need the money back. Understandably so. We've all been there. And when you're perfectly or infinitely wealthy, you just give. Who cares? It's like there's always more where that comes from. What do you need? 10 million, 100 million? It's good. You know, and you don't do it for any other reason. Not even, you don't even do it for them. You do it again from a selfish place where it's like it feels so good to just hand out you know, $100 bills everywhere you go. It feels so good to just hand out compliments and connect with people. It feels so good to you. So when you're giving is the gift itself, your giving is the reward itself. You experience that first. You don't even wait around for someone to say thank you. Who cares if they say thank you? I benefited first and foremost by being loving, by being unselfish, by giving away what I had in excess or what I had in infinite fashion. No, oh, absolutely. And that's something I, I'm always encouraging my listeners to, and my clients to do because contribution is, I think, the most fulfilling thing. And actually, when I got divorced and my first Christmas without my son, which was just to me the worst thing ever at that point, um, that I thought, right, I'm going to go and work at a homeless shelter for Christmas. So for those four days over Christmas, I went along, they said no jewellery, no makeup, just old clothes, just come on in. And I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm really going to do some good this Christmas. I'm going to help a lot of people. And actually, it just blew me away. I got so much more from that, of that experience than I ever gave. And I made lifelong friends. It was just the most beautiful experience. And that's something I think that if you hold on to things like money, when, when you don't have it, actually, you experience lack. When you give, 
you know, even when you're at your lowest, like I wasn't in a great place that year, but I gave and oh my goodness, I came out like a whole person and more from that experience. So absolutely with you on that. That's so inspiring. It's so uplifting. It's so exciting. I love that you shared that. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, there was a period in my life when I really struggled with that. When I was young, I was constantly trying to give from this place of um, scarcity and emptiness. And I didn't know it, but I had this expectation. I always gave with strings attached. I didn't know it. Um, I wouldn't say anything to the person, but I'd say, geez, they didn't even say thank you, or they didn't seem very grateful, or they never did, did give me back that money or that book or whatever. And I would, it made me worse, and I feel worse and worse for it. And then I realized that there was two pieces to it. Um, and the first piece was a mindset thing, right? Like I was trying to give, but I hadn't really shifted my mindset around it. And so I was still actually only giving to get. That's selfish. When I gave simply for the joy of giving, you know, I was, I fell in love with loving. I fell in love with giving for its own sake. You know, I realized that a mindset shift had taken place, a perceptual shift had taken place. And of course, in miracles, they call that a miracle, right? When there's a shift in perception. And that made all the difference. And this is why you see the studies to your point, Sarah, that say over and over again, happy people give more but also people who give more are happier. <laughs> so we call it an upward positive feedback loop. It's called a virtuous cycle, but essentially the better you feel, the better you do. And the better you do, the better you feel. And that goes for not just giving and charities and things of that nature, but also work performance, relationships, money, all night. Yeah, gosh, it's just so true. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing this because it's just I mean, so resonating with me, but I know a lot of my listeners will be getting so, so much out of this. So one of the things you touched on there in that point as well was that talking nicely about people and finding the things you love. Now, I know I can hear their voices now. I'm supposed to say nice things about my ex after what they've done to me. <laughs> what, what would you say to that, Robert? Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, start where it's easy. Um, you don't have to torture yourself on the way to happiness. Please don't. Please don't. Like the path of least resistance. I'm all about lazy intelligence. Like let's not make hard work of happiness. Let's not make hard work of relaxation. Let's not make hard work of love. Let's take an easier, more enjoyable path of ease. Okay. So start with the low hanging fruit. So don't start with the X. Don't start with the family, okay? Maybe start with a stranger. Maybe start with the children. Maybe start with the puppies or the kittens. You know, start with where it's easy. So if you find it difficult to find something to appreciate about someone in your life, focus on someone else. Focus on anything else. You don't even have to focus on people, right? You can focus on animals. You don't have to focus on animals. You can focus on trees. You don't have to focus on anything living. You can focus on something that's material in your life. It's all good. Any reason is a good reason to feel good, period. Start where it's easy. And I promise... If you keep that up for long enough, and you'll keep it up if you enjoy it, if you force yourself to do it, you're not going to keep it up, and therefore you're not going to get the benefit. So do it because it's fun. Start where it's easy. Continue that. In about 22 to 66 days, you'll rewire your brain to do it automatically. That's the whole science of neuroplasticity. We know we literally rewire the brain when we stay consistent with a new habit. Okay. Eventually, I promise, you'll one day look back at the X okay, or the current partner, or any number of people, the in-laws, and you'll start to see without any effort why or what within them makes you feel good, what you can appreciate about them. For me, for instance, a good example is I have never dated anything but really beautiful, brilliant, and wonderful women, okay? That's not a testament to me. That is a testament to them, and I have not had always the easiest relationships in my life, obviously, that's how I'm here. To, you know, it's like I've only learned mostly through quote unquote failure, which I call feedback. But every single woman I've ever dated, every single person I've ever met, um, has been a personal trainer for my soul. That's one way to put it. They've been a personal trainer for unconditional happiness, for unconditional love, for unconditional self love, and for unconditional peace. And without those folks um, in my life, I would not be where I am today. And so I'm deeply, truly, fully grateful for each and every experience I've had, especially including the most difficult ones and the most difficult people. Yeah, absolutely. And actually that's interesting because, you know, my when I train my coaches to become breakup and divorce coaches, quite often in those sessions, they go, Sarah, oh, this information is really good stuff. I'm going, yeah, everyone can just say thank you to my ex for putting me through that. 
because I wouldn't be able to share it with you without it. And they laugh, but then they can like say, okay, well, maybe we can do this with ours because actually, as you say, those learnings make us stronger. And without those experiences, we wouldn't feel the lows to be able to feel the highs either. So it definitely makes us more resilient, I think. That's and I think powerful. sometimes when you've, when you've been to hell and back, you kind of think, well, if I can get through that, I can get through anything. And if you've got that attitude to life, it does open a lot more doors and enables you to, to feel happy because who cares what's around the corner? You know, you can survive it, right? You just nailed it. And that's the entire, that entire field of science of adversity. Um, you know, we know that adversity causes us to stop, slow down, and reprioritize what's truly important in our lives, first and foremost. Second, it weeds out bad relationships. Third, it strengthens the strong relationships. Fourth, it's through the experience of, it, you often need to experience what you're not in order to remember who you truly are, what you truly want and like, right? So it's a values clarification exercise. That's the first thing, so the first part of it. The other part of it is that, you know, everything and everybody in your life and the world in general is not designed to make you happy. That's important to remember, okay? That it's designed to make you aware, to make you conscious, okay? But the more aware and conscious you become, the happier you become and the happier you become, the more conscious you become. So everything and everybody in the world is really doing you a greater service and justice than you realize. Most of us want the people and things in our lives to deliver happiness, but they do something great at that. They remind you that they're really unreliable sources of happiness. And so they point you back to yourself and say, if you wanna be happy, if you wanna be in love, if you wanna feel peace, that's within you, not me. My job here out there here in the world, even despite my best effort, is to disappoint you and disappoint you as quickly as humanly possible so you remember your own creative power. You know, but we, we, we miss that. We see the closed door and we get so focused on the closed door, we forget that the lesson is, Sarah, Robert, whoever you are out there, you're a powerful creator and manifester. You already have and are everything you're searching for within everyone else and everything else in the world. And if you just stop doing that, if you start, stop seeking outside of yourself and look deep inside, I promise you not only have what you're looking for, but you have an, an infinite abundance. You know, you have an infinite portion of it. And so that's an important thing to remember because if you don't, you'll blame people and circumstances for how you feel. And in your blaming them, you disempower yourself to do anything about it, to make any changes around it. Right? Um, we can't let conditions and circumstances or other people dictate how we think and feel. If we do, we render ourselves powerless to think and feel and even do better. Oh, wow. I love that. I'm just letting it sink in here. I mean, I, I'm with you on that. Like, don't give your power away to other people, take your power back. And when you have your power back, you can shine your light. I was talking all the time to my to my coaches that you've got to shine your light shine your light as bright you can and and sometimes things happen in life which might dull it or even blow it out for a time but it's our job to focus on lighting our own light and then we shine that forward and then we attract the goodness to us but it but it's a it's a manifestation it's not a you know trying to grab something or focus on or force something like you said earlier it should flow it should come naturally when you start to force things that's the resistance and that's where the unhappiness comes in Oh, I love this so much. You know, that's what enlightenment means. It means letting that light shine forth, right? Enlightenment is lightening up. It's also letting go of what doesn't let you stay light in life, right? Like to say that, you know, remain the light in life, but also stay light that burdens you, right? It's letting go of all that. So you're absolutely right about that. The other thing I just want to highlight because it's so powerful and profound what you said. I just love it. It's that we are literally made of stardust, right? The bodies are literally made of stardust, you know? And so it's important to remember that, like, you're literally a star. Each one of us is a star. Each one of us is nothing really but light. And if you spend most of your life focusing on the darkness within and around you, you'll just find more and more darkness. Um, the key and opportunity in life is to focus on the light, both within yourself and others. And even if there's just a tiny little sparkle or candle flicker of that light, if you can focus obsessively on that light, you'll be surprised you'll begin to catch other things on fire, right? That's how we catch the world on fire and catch each other on fire. So just focus on the light, no matter how small it is. Let that become almost your myopic focus. And I promise you that light will begin to sort of spread um, to other people and other things. And before you know it, your whole life will be lit up.
Oh, I love it. I love it. And actually, it can be quite fun with your ex, even if they're being difficult, to shine your light really bright in front of them because their reaction, even though this is all energetic, it just blows my mind every time. And it makes me laugh and it makes me happy in, in a way that I'm just doing the best I can, you know, doing the right thing, shining my light, whatever's going on over there. You know, I always talk about Teflon suit, zip up your Teflon suit, but shine your light. That's the most important thing. And with difficult exes, it is quite a fun game to entertain because instead of being spiteful or getting down to their energy, you're just giving, you know, bright light and energy and actually watching them, I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to see what you think on that, Robert, but their oh. reaction is obviously usually quite amusing to watch. Oh, I love that. I just want to give you a huge hug just for even sharing that and saying that. I couldn't agree with you more. Look, and that's one of the greatest tests ever. The fact that you can even say that and say it with so much authenticity for me is really encouraging and super inspiring. It's true. Access can be difficult. I mean, people can be difficult. People are going to remain people That's important to remember, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And you don't want to resist resistance. You want to defend against people that are defensive. You want to be careful of that. You know, sometimes we uh, want to fight unconsciousness, but fighting unconsciousness is unconsciousness, right? Like fighting ignorance is ignorance. And you have to remember, sometimes people are too ignorant to know they're ignorant. They're too unconscious to know they're unconscious. It's like being too drunk to know you're drunk. You ever try to reason with a drunk person? I like remembering that sometimes, you know, you have the act of someone else, just remember they're drunk. They're drunk on unconsciousness. They might be drunk on ignorance. They're drunk on all kinds of things, ego, no. right? And so you don't try to argue with a drunk person. You laugh or you joke or you turn your focus somewhere else. You go for a walk. You make an excuse to go to the convenience store. Whatever you need to do to refine or to rediscover or recenter yourself on that light and that peaceful liveness within you that's always there. God, call it God if you want, um, is helpful. And so, you know, you're right. It's critical and important to not let anybody or anything in life dim your light or dim it for too long. Um, you came into this world to be a light, you will remain a light and we need your light. Yeah, and we all control how we respond to things and, and what we do with that, our reactions. So absolutely important. Okay, I know I've taken you way off topic. You started with one point one of your four steps. So how do you tap back into that happiness and love? So yeah. <laughs> carry on. Yeah, so good memory. Boy, you've got a great memory. So um, let's see. So first step actually I would say, come before that one. So we'll call the one, we just shared around focusing on the best in life and other people and within yourself simply to feel good. We'll call that step two. Step one, um, for those folks who struggle with step two, and I get it because I struggled for a long time, is to start with an even, even lower hanging fruit, which is to focus on or identify four main buckets in your life. Happiness islands, okay? Or you can call them love islands, but those are activities that allow you to feel happy, inspired, excited, to be alive with very little time, energy, effort, okay? So just identify those activities. It might be listening to music, it'd be a special fr friend, it might be going to the beach, it might be reading certain books, happiness islands or love islands. Also identify your happiness deserts or love deserts. Those are basically places, activities, um, things that make you feel drained, where you don't feel very happy, where you feel um, maybe average in terms of emotion, no matter how hard you try or how much time energy effort you put in so you're identifying these deserts or valleys on one hand and these islands on the other um you know you can also identify what i call your success island success um valleys success islands are things that just make um that you're very good at sort of effortlessly and easily um success valleys are things that success deserts are things that no matter how hard you try you're not very good at you really want to spend your life on the overlapping islands so those things you really enjoy or really love that make you feel happy and those things that you're extraordinarily gifted at. That overlap right there, that's how you stay in flow state. Flow state is like the vortex, it's like the zone. When you're like tapped in, tuned into the flow state, you're just so happily and positively engaged, absorbed and consumed with what you're doing or who you're with that you lose track of time and you lose track of yourself. You're not self-conscious anymore. And in that state, you're 500 to a thousand percent more productive, creative, efficient, effective um, and joyful. Okay, so that's probably step one just really focus on the islands, but make sure you're trying to eliminate or reverse engineer out of your life, all the deserts and valleys. Um, step one, step two was what we talked about before. Another way to talk about step two is just to tell a better feeling story about everything and everybody in your life based in truth, right? So it has to be based in truth. If it's a snow job or it feels like you're making it up, that's not so great. So good example, let's say it's raining outside. 
most of us will say, oh, it's a bad day. Maybe it's a bad day, unless you love rain. And you say, it's a bad day. Is that true? It's like, there's a, what's the truthful, better feeling story? Well, the truthful, better feeling story is, I know the sun, the sun will come up tomorrow or the day after. When it rains, it sure makes me appreciate the sunny weather that much more. I do love the rain because it does sort of nourish all of the plant life and the plant life is so great to prevent erosion and all these things, right? You find a way to think about this experience so that you feel better as a result of doing so. Okay, you wanna do that with everything. If you have an empty bank account, instead of saying you're broke, okay, I get that. You could also say, there's only up from here. That's true. You have zero dollars, <laughs> only up from here, yeah. right? Because whichever way you look at it, it, does, it, it doesn't change the fact of the situation that it's raining or there's no money in your bank account. But what it does is it increases your ability to maybe what feel better, which then puts you in a better position to do something about that, right? Oh my gosh. Boom, right? And that's actually true. It does both that, you're right, it puts you in a much better, much more creative problem solving mindset. You're much better equipped to solve your problems or do something about them when you're feeling better emotionally. We know that. That's why when you're depressed, you just wanna lay in bed. You don't wanna do anything. Even things you're genuinely interested in, sex and spending money, whatever it is, you don't wanna do any of it, you're done. You just wanna lay there. You know, Even that you don't wanna do. So you're right about that. The other piece of it is, of course, it's highly attractive and magnetic, right? The better you feel, the better people feel around you, right? So there's that. Um, the third piece is really just a version of the third one, uh, first one, which is just identifying those people that make you or allow you to feel happiest mm -hmm. in the easiest possible fashion or feel most loved or loving in the easiest um, fashion. Spend more time with those people and do what you can to spend less time with the energy vampires, the people that don't make you feel so happy or loved or loving. The fourth step is probably what I'd argue is the most direct path to peace, love, and happiness you could possibly imagine. And you can't imagine it because it's all about not thinking. So the first three steps, uh, first step is really an action journey step. The second step is really about uh, sort of a mental or emotional journey step. Uh, the third one is really about people. It's a people step. This fourth one um, is not about action. It's a state of non-action. It's not about people. It's about presence. And it's not about thought. It's about no thought. It's about changing your mind or your heart. It's about going to that place where there is no mind and all there is is love. Okay. And so this is simply about letting go of all of your thoughts as consistently and non-judgment, non-judgmentally, as humanly possible, as frequently as possible. Right. So an easy way to do it is to practice breathing from the stomach. And there's a specific practice I use called micro meditation. A micro meditation is one breath. So if you've ever taken a meditation class and you've ever felt like me and you thought you were having a panic attack, I once went to this meditation class and there's like 30 of the most beautiful women. It was like, they were all Sarah's, like, well, not really, there's only one Sarah, but there's like, you know, a fraction of that, but there were 30 of them in the class and they were all expert meditators, it seemed. And I just simply um, was not able to meditate even for a second. I was just having a, like a panic attack. So I realized 30 minutes was too long, five minutes was probably too long, but I could do one breath. So with the micro meditation, all you do is you pretend like this breath, this moment is the last breath or moment you'll ever have on this planet. And so you wanna be sincere about that. And you wanna recognize that's true. This may be your last moment. We don't know that. We might have a hundred years left, hopefully, hopefully a thousand years left, but we might also have five minutes left or five seconds left. And so you wanna treat this one single now moment as though it really mattered, as though it was all important because it is. And so for this one moment, you pretend like it's the last moment that you'll ever have. And you simply do everything you can to juice this one breath, this one moment for as much joy and happiness as you can possibly get out of it. And you can best juice or milk this moment for as much joy as you can possibly get by letting all your thoughts go, breathing through the nose, let your stomach expand more than it normally would, Breathe out of the mouth and let your stomach contract or flatten out more than it normally would. And do it just for joy's sake alone. Really try to just enjoy it. Don't try to get good at it. That's the one way to not get good at it. Try to enjoy it. That's the one way to get good at it really fast. If you could just practice that as frequently as you can remember throughout the day, no matter what else you're doing, I promise you'd rewire your brain for the happiness and the self-love that you're ultimately after.
Oh, you're definitely talking my language with the warm breath. I'm one of those people that tries to meditate and then I'm panicking and beating myself up that I'm not doing it right because I've got all these thoughts I'm not supposed to have. So I'm focusing on getting rid of the thought, but the fact that I'm thinking that means there is a thought and it just, yeah. So this is brilliant. I love it. Simple and easy, which is what you need when you're overwhelmed and in a, in a tough situation. So perfect. Wow. Well, I mean, I could talk to you for weeks because there's just so much good information that you're sharing with us. So thank you so much. Tell us where people can find you, Robert. If people want to come and get some coaching with you or follow you, where can they go? Yeah. Um, first, I want to thank you for saying that. I can receive that and I fully reflect that back. I believe a large reason I was so suicidal at such a young age is because I wasn't able to have these conversations or listen to these conversations or have access to them. So you're doing such an incredible service for me and for people like me in the world. So thank you for that, truly. Not just for what you do, but for who you are. Um, so I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation. Um, second, if folks want to find, you're welcome. If folks want to find uh, me online, you can at coachrobmack.com. That's my website. You can also find me on all social media platforms, most notably Instagram at Rob Mac, M -A -C -K, official. You can find both my books, Happiness from the Inside Out and Love from the Inside Out, everywhere great books are sold, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Banyan Books, uh, and pretty much everywhere else. Brilliant. I've got them both on Kindle, and I recommend them to everybody. Uh, brilliant. So my last question that I said I was going to ask you. So my podcast, as you know, is called Heartbreak to Happiness. And I think it's really important to know what happiness is for you so you can tap into it along the way when you're having one of those tougher moments as we talked about earlier so Robert what is happiness for you yeah it's silence and stillness it's the silence and stillness that I sometimes also call God so it's also felt oneness with life so we don't have a life we are life we don't have a life we are life right um, so we are one with life when you feel that oneness with life that we can and you can feel into your body that life energy that pulsating vibrating energy in your hands right now it's in your feet it's in your body quote unquote that is life you are one with that you are that when you feel into that that's love you're always feeling into it but you're not always aware of it so love happiness essentially are life which i call god it's life felt, it's God felt, it's life embraced, it's God embraced. Not the condition and circumstances of your life. I'm talking about life, that non-physical energy. So it sounds very abstract, but you can best experience it in stillness and silence. Practicing the presence of God is a great way of talking about it. Meditation, prayer, these are all ways of talking about the same exact experience, which is kind of a non-experience. It's just the awareness that you exist. At first, it feels like nothing, but the more you practice just noticing, wait, I'm alive, full stop. You don't notice what you are, you notice that you are. That Just notice that over and over again. It feels like nothing, I promise. It feels so paltry and stupid, but you continue to practice that all day, every day. You start to feel this love bubble up to the surface. That's true love. And when you feel that, you have everything you're looking for in a partner or a lover in a relationship. And you find that you attract the partner, the lover and the relationship if that's your wanting. Ooh, so incredible. Your words are so profound, really resonate. And I know that you'll have helped so many people listening to this today. So thank you, Robert, for your time. Thank you for being a fabulous guest. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so honored to be a part of the conversation and I'm so excited to continue the conversation and uh, friendship, thank you. Oh, thank you. That's it for today's episode. Do head on over to coachrobmack.com to find out all about Rob and the work he's doing. And I look forward to you joining me on my next episode. That's it for today's episode of Heartbreak to Happiness. That's it for today's Don't episode forget to subscribe of Heartbreak and to leave happiness. a review to win a free Don't ticket to, to one of Sara's virtual review to win a free ticket the retreat to one of Sara's transformative combination of live the retreats webinars are a transformative with combination of live webinars empowering with online Sara herself, video programs coupled designed with to help you cope better with your breakup video programs and start feeling to happy you cope better with your breakup. For more details, start feeling head on over to Heartbreak to Happiness podcast. Head on over to Heartbreak to Happiness podcast. Where you can also get a copy of Sara's free gift.
you can also get a Thank copy you and of join us again on the next episode for Thank another you. join dose us again of on the next episode for another dose of heartbreak to happiness on our next episode.